So a summary of last week's lecture was on community memory place and attachment and was week two in our six week course. It gave an overview understanding of these concepts of community memory, placehood and belonging and used a case study of Jewish heritage to outline and explore how community heritage affects our identity and shapes our sense of belonging through acts of intangible and tangible practice. Welcome to week four. This week we will look into the idea of historical narratives. This will link into the topics spoken about in previous weeks to reiterate the idea that our her heritage and ancestry shape our sense of community belonging in the present day. These ideas will be explored as we delve straight into the case study for this week on the Sydney Jewish Museum. This case study shows how ancestral and multi-generational memory affects the historical narratives told within community settings in effect, shaping our sense of contemporary heritage identity. This particular case also looks into the effects of trauma and how this impacts our community heritage. The discussion topics for this week will cover how do historical narratives shape our identity? How does history shape our present day understanding of heritage? And how does memory shape the historical narratives that define our heritage and communities? So, what is heritage narrative? Well, a heritage narrative is a narrative story that directly relates to heritage. It is the explanation of heritage. As history is a contemporary construction about the reality of the past rather than a direct representation of it, heritage storytelling seeks to provide the realistic reconstruction of this through individual and subjective interpretation. What is memoryscapes? A memoryscape is a multi-sensory immersive participatory experience of memory, often achieved through the retelling of a heritage story experienced through the practices of oral history, video and technological practices. A memoryscape is a site of concentrated cultural practice, where the main cultural function is to give meaning attributed to the past-present relationship of history. How does this affect memory? Well, in terms of displaying heritage and connecting audiences to heritage material, the production of storytelling and memoryscapes elicits an emotive response in the audience, which helps to deepen their connection to heritage material on display, creating a stronger bond between the audience and their material. Before we go into the case study, it's important to have a brief understanding of the function of the museum and in particular looking at how the idea of the new museum being an empathic contemporary space has come about. So, the progression of the contemporary museum has given way to an appreciation of sensitive heritage and museum practices, which value feelings and emotions of a visitor. This has been seen as transposable techniques employed that facilitate self-reflection and empathy. Beginning with a commitment to a visitor-centered model within the framework of the new museum and an institutional self-awareness, Curators and educational teams have employed this potential through a personalized signpost or connection between the object and visitor to help facilitate audience emotivity. Museums' attempts to facilitate this kind of audience engagement founded on empathic self-reflexive knowledge are crucial in advancing the way museums can bolster the ideas of new museology and act as positive examples for other epistemic institutions to learn from. One particular pedagogical practice used to engage in empathic audience engagement is oral history, which will be discussed in the case study. Oral history is the personal presentation of history, whether it be through a talk to a group, 
in a professional setting like a museum or personal conversations between friends. It is the presentation of one's subjective memories of a historical event that often shapes an individual's ancestral heritage and their sense of attachment and belonging to their community. Through the act of vocalizing their memories, they solidify their experiences and their sense of identity. This act of oral history will be used as an example of historical narratives being cemented in the fabric of the community identity and memory. The Sydney Jewish Museum is one key example of an institutional setting that uses oral history as their key pedagogy to engage and educate diverse audiences in the traumatic events of the Holocaust. The practice of oral history has been implemented largely in history museums. In particular, Holocaust museums has, have used it as a vital component of connecting to their audience and allowing the audience to personalise with the content. The Sydney Jewish Museum in Sydney, Australia uses oral history and this first came about as the visitor-focused education expected from museums was being cemented in the social expectations of the public. This allowed visitors to gain a personal connection with the content and helped bring a more real, universal humanitarianism to the forefront of the Sydney Museum. This ideological repositioning was transformed into the praxis of working firsthand with survivors, allowing their testimonies to be placed at the centre of the museum's programming. This has taken the form of directly talking to school groups, social and cultural leaders, educational groups, as well as the general public through guided tours and more recently as the survivors age and their mobility weakens through one-to-one -one conversations in a question and answer format. This pedagogical model aligns closely with an empathic model, being a visitor-focused and visitor needs-based approach, as the informal Q&A format provides the audience with the opportunity to pose questions and have their own needs recognized and met. Furthermore, these practices exemplify the theoretical ideals of new museology, where the museum is a cultural space alive with people, with the volunteer survivors both presenting experiential and didactic information in a visitor-centered model. The survivors focus on correlating their stories to larger scale human rights themes in order to educate their audience about the Holocaust and the consequences of hatred and racism more universally, aligned closely with the UDHR, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, both of which are linked as the Holocaust Museum's basis there are a number of psychological processes that are affected through the act of oral history. This is a scene in play in survivor testimony and its impact on the visitor. This is due to the personal interaction created by face-to-face -face testimony between the survivor and visitor that is able to produce a prosthetic memory of the Holocaust in visitors. Prosthetic memory, defined by Alison Landsberg, is an alternative living memory produced in those who did not live through the event, but who received a memory of it via the exposure to the memories and experiences of others. The Sydney Jewish Museum's use of everyday objects and the survivors' descriptions and accounts of the Holocaust acting as signposts to the audience enable them to relate to the material in a personalized manner, in turn resulting in the production of a prosthetic memory. Avril Alba, a curator of the Sydney Jewish Museum, notes that beyond the Jewish community, non-Jewish people can experience an imaginative identification with the highly personal and intimate oral testimonies the survivors give to the audience. This imaginative identification with the survivors' testimonies produced what Gary Wiseman, a cultural theorist, deemed as the phenomena of experiencing a state of non-witness. The non-witness includes individuals who have received prosthetic memory of the Holocaust but have no first-hand experience of it themselves, yet relate to the information shared by the survivors as if it were their own, 
relating to them as if it were their own heritage. The lineal quality of the museum allows it to exist as a transcendental space, somewhere between the audience's own reality and that of the survivor, emphasised by the curatorial and architectural cues which depict scenes of the Holocaust throughout the museum. All these components allow the audience to produce empathy through an imagined memory of themselves from within the survivor's experience of the Holocaust. Protestatic memory is linked to the cognitive process of mimesis, referred to by the cultural theorist Walter Benjamin as a human capacity to cognitively recognize and produce similarity. Similar to empathy, the non-witness visitor is able to mimic the survivor's stories and oral histories and go into a state of envisioning the atrocities the survivor has experienced themselves. The sociologist Celia Lucy relates this state of non-witness to limiting the distance between the object and audience and invites them into not just a fantasy about the Holocaust survivor, but a fantasy about themselves living through the Holocaust survivor. Through these theoretical findings, one central component appears integral in the production of empathy and prosthetic memory, which is that to emphasize with something and to empathize with something, a person has to self-referentially connect to it. The cognitive process of prosthetic memory relies on the audience's episodic memories of the past experiences so they may relate to the material presented in the exhibition and throughout the oral history testimony and self-referentially relate this back to a memory about themselves. This is seen, for example, in the display of survivors' personal possessions. This personal connection with the oral history testimonies and the objects within the museum is a psychological process of personalization, which occurs through the overlay of overarching messages produced by the museum. Ari Lander, an educational officer at the Sydney Jewish Museum, reflects on the power objects have in gaining a human connection, stating that photographs and textbooks cannot bring to life the history of the Holocaust in the same way artifacts can. For example, a wooden boat on display donated to the museum's collection by a Holocaust survivor is a relic of the survivor. The boat was given to the survivor by her brother who at the time of carving it was an imprisoned slave to the Nazis during the occupation of France. At first, the boat appears a normal feature, but the semiotic response of the audience is due to their familiar frame of reference, appearing as something that they can relate to. Yet, when this object is overlaid with the personal narrative of the survivor's oral testimony, then a far greater impact on the audience's mimetic faculty to produce such a prosthetic memory in turn results in them connecting to the material first at first hand. The object represents the personal and the everyday, yet it also encapsulates Jewish heritage. And this goes into the idea of object narratives, where an emotional connection to personal ties, family and memory can be embedded within an object. It also represents the duality of good versus evil between the perpetrator of from the Nazi-run state and the victim, the Jewish people. This aligns closely with what the uh, sociologist Jeffrey Alexander said as the survivor and perpetrator roles performed by visitors of the Jewish Museum as they experience the exhibition and hear survivor testimonies. All this being said, there are ethical dilemmas which occur when survivor testimony is enacted and this bestowal of heritage memory is transferred from the survivor to the audience who have not themselves personally experienced this trauma or memory, but instead create a falsified memory of this state. The historical literature in the Holocaust as discussed by James E. Young, identifies issues surrounding memory and memorialization that directly face the Sydney Jewish Museum's use of oral history survivor testimonies. 
These issues include the complexities of presenting history as historiographic representation, and this is in part connected to the idea that truthhoods in and of themselves are bound to subjective memory and are too convoluted to describe as right or wrong. Yet, historiography faces itself as it is made possible to view survivor oral history as correct and right in the authoritarian walls of the museum. So oral history becomes questionable because the survivors are human fallible and aging as are their memories and because they do not have the same ethical parameters whilst displaying oral history as written history has, their historiographical standards are not the same. It, it its own inextricable confines as so a conclusion of this week's lecture was to look at the idea of historical narratives and how our heritage and ancestry shape our sense of community belonging in the present day. After discussion and outline of this, the case study of the Sydney Jewish Museum was used to help discuss how ancestral multi-generational memory affects the historical narratives told within our community settings. In effect, helping to shape our sense of contemporary heritage identities. This particular case study should have given you a good understanding into the effects of trauma and historic events like the Holocaust and how this can shape our community heritage identity. And next week we'll be moving on to a different idea and concept which is around issues in conserving and preserving community heritage. So now we have outlined these more ephemeral, emotional and institutional understandings of what cultural heritage and community heritage is. We can look at how that is actually enacted in legal and bureaucratic terms when specifically non-Western environments and communities are in effect outlined and overarchingly um, affected by institutional Western heritage bodies.